Welcome to Page One, the award-winning show for writers with the reader in mind. That, that draws the reader along just like fiction. Here's your host and producer, Zita Christian. Hi everyone, welcome to page one. I'm Zita Christian. My guest tonight is Ron Winter. He is an author of fiction and nonfiction. He is a public relations executive. He is an award-winning journalist, a good friend, and he is a Vietnam vet. He is the author of a memoir titled Masters of the Art, A Fighting Marine's Memoir of Vietnam, he was on the show a while back to talk about that, but he's involved in a whole new project, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Ron, welcome back to the Thank show. You. It's really nice. This feels like old times yeah, having you sure here. It does. So we're going to talk about something called Operation Dewey Canyon. Yes, we are. So um, tell me what that was and why was and is it so important to our understanding of the Vietnam War. Okay. Uh, operation, in, in Vietnam we didn't have so much what they call battles as we had operations. Okay. Uh, and operations were, they could last anywhere from one or two weeks to a couple of months. Um, operation Dewey Canyon was the last Marine operation of the Vietnam War. It was conducted uh, the end of January 1969 through March of 1969. Um, and it was highly successful. It was conducted in the worst possible terrain, uh, right up against the Laotian border, some of the most remote parts of the country, um, and in the, in the worst weather. It was dead in the middle of the monsoons. Mm -hmm. It required uh, resupply. There, were, there was no way to resupply by ground, so it re required constant resupply by air, but at the same time, it was socked in. The whole area was socked in by monsoon clouds and storms, for a good part of the operation. So the guys on the ground, uh, they, they just conducted themselves. It was the, the 9th Marine Regiment, all three battalions of the 9th Marines, uh, conducted themselves with, with the utmost of professionalism. It, it, they were so successful in what they did under the absolute worst of circumstances. Uh, and I was there. I, I was a helicopter gunner. Uh, both of the units that I served in in Vietnam participated in, in Dewey Canyon, um, both in the initial phases of, of getting the troops in and then in the later resupplies and, and the, uh, getting the medevacs out. A lot of my friends um, got, got very seriously highly decorated uh, for their actions in there, including uh, distinguished flying crosses and silver stars for heroism. Um, and the guys on the ground, even more. There were four Medal of Honor uh, recipients wow. in that wow. one operation, only one of whom, uh, Colonel we it's now Colonel, retired Colonel Wesley Fox, he was a lieutenant at the time. Uh, he's the only one who survived. Uh, and why I got involved in it uh, all these years later is the United States Marine Corps History and Museums Division is putting out a 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemorative series and there's a, a wide range of, of uh, publications they'll be doing uh, relative to the Vietnam War. And earlier this year I got a, a message from a, a retired Marine, woman Marine gunnery sergeant who was involved with the, with the History Division and she knew that I had written Masters of the Art and, and that I, I write for a living and she told me, hey, Ron, you know, we're looking for somebody to do uh, the, the official history of, of the Battle of Dewey Canyon. Are you interested? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> as a matter yeah. of fact. Uh, and, of and she said, well, here's where you submit, you know, your resume, and you've got to have a letter of introduction. And uh, I, I sent down my resume with all the things, many of the things you mentioned in my <laughs> introduction here, mm -hmm. and told them, you know, I, 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 I want to do this because I was there and my friends were there. Uh, and you know, I consider it an honor, and I do. And the letter came back about three weeks later, okay, let's get started. <laughs> I'm going to pause here just for a minute because I want to just be sure that the people in the audience know some of the additional information when we're talking about why it was so obvious that Ron was qualified. He was the best qualified person to write this story. So you flew 300 combat missions as a Marine helicopter machine gunner in Vietnam. You were awarded 15 air medals, combat aircrew wings, 
and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, among many other decorations. And um, also, Ron is a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He's a, quite the award-winning journalist. Just want to be sure we get that in because I know you would <laughs> not mention that yourself. You're right. So, so this, because this is page one, so of course there would be a connection here somehow to a book or to writing of some kind. So this book is, is not, it does not exist yet. No. You're working on it now. I am. Okay. And um, so the, I was going to ask whose idea it was to write it, but it is part of a larger series. Yes. So there will be a series of books about various operations in the um, war. Even more than that, it's even more extensive. Uh, about a week ago they sent me the first book in the series that was written by a retired general um, and it's on the early years and it, it goes all the way back to post-World War II and talks about what was going on in Vietnam and then when the Marines, I, I, didn't, I never knew this before, the first Marine advisor in Vietnam was there in 1953. The French were still there. Yeah, we've been in Vietnam Ooh. since 53. Um, and so I've been reading uh, this gentleman's book, and it's it's just fascinating. I mean, there's so much information in here. Uh, and what and what the history division uh, did for me was they said an awful lot has been written in the, in the in the battle chronologies about this, and and so you can go in and, and use whatever you want. Um, but we're going to give you at least forty percent new material. Now, what I was told. Um, by the lady that originally uh, suggested I check into this is that most of the the uh, publications from the Marine History Museum are, are uh, History and Museum Division are done by by officers going through the command and staff college usually majors lieutenant colonels in fact there's a book on HMM 161 the unit I served with that was written by one of our pilots now when he was with us he was a captain when he wrote this this history he was a lieutenant colonel um, but she said it's very rarely that former enlisted men get an opportunity for enlisted personnel, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, get an opportunity. And, and she says this, so it's an even an even bigger honor in many ways because you went on and did other things after your time in the Marine Corps. Um, somebody just sent me an email the other day. And said, "What was your rank in in Vietnam?" So I was a lance corporal when I got there. And I was a corporal when I left, and my my highest pay grade was sergeant. You know, and that that was it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I was out of the out of the Marines. Um, so this, this, what this has done is, I, the approach I'm taking is an awful lot of the previous writing has been done from uh, an eagle eye view. What the commanders were doing, where the units were moving, uh, who was over here, who was over there, who was climbing this hill, what, what I'm doing, and I started this in, in, in June, we had a reunion of HMM 161 down in Memphis, and a lot of my friends were there, 40 or so of my friends. Uh, and I told the guys before we got down there, if you uh, had input on Operation Dewey Canyon, um, then we'll sit down and we'll do some interviews. So on Saturday afternoon of the weekend we had the interview, I sat the whole afternoon interviewing my friends wow. about these things. Now there was uh, one of our pilots, uh, Gary Fries, was a captain. He retired as a, I think it was Lieutenant Colonel or Colonel. Uh, Gary got the Distinguished Flying Cross. You, if you read some of the previous chronologies of what happened to Dewey Canyon, you'll, you'll see that there was a battle um, that, that took place on a ridge line, and, and it was terrible. It was a tough, tough battle. And Golf Company uh, was, was involved in that battle, and they prevailed. But they had six guys killed and 18 guys wounded that had to get medevac. But they were socked in, and they couldn't get the, the rescue helicopters into them. So these guys moved off a ridge line. Another unit came up and replaced them, and over this, all night long, they were moving down off this ridge line off a hill with a 70% slope. Oh my gosh, that's like going straight down. Almost, and they had to carry the dead and wounded down with them, and they had makeshift stretchers. And Now first off, what happened was they, they'll say in the, in the other ones, well, two CH-46 helicopters got in and got the wounded and dead out, and then they go on to something else. Well, Gary was the, the pilot of the lead CH-46. It's not enough to say that they got in. They had to land in a river on a flat rock with a waterfall right behind them. And one of the reasons Gary got the DFC was because when he came out of there, he was grossly overloaded. Well, I had heard about that, but I didn't know why. But while I'm interviewing Gary, he's telling me what he was doing to fly, come in on this very, very low cloud cover, has to turn around and just get his rear wheels down on this rock. So he's a little bit balanced, drops the ramp, you know. Well, 
Ed Irwin from up in Michigan was the crew chief, a friend of mine. And Jeff Harnley from Wisconsin, good, really great friend of mine. He was, he was an electrician like I was. We, we served together for almost three years, was a starboard gunner. So I asked him, Gary, how do you get overloaded? And Ed says, because I messed up. Didn't actually say it that way. And he really <laughs> didn't. But, you know, what happened was the guys were coming down off this, this steep escarpment and out onto this river. Now, Ed is in the back on his, they had what they call a long court, so he could get out to the back beyond the ramp and, and just guide people in. Mm -hmm. So normally, the guys that are carrying other guys on stretchers, which they didn't have too many stretchers, they had makeshift things yeah. that they were using. They would go in and set the stretchers down, and then there was a, at the front of the cabin, just behind the cockpit, there was a, there was a hatch that you could go out. So Ed's in the back, and he can't see much. You got, you got mountains coming around, right down like this, and you got the river, and you got the waterfall, and the engines, and all this going on. So he's counting the number of stretchers. What he didn't know is that the guys that are carrying the stretchers were also medevac. So instead of setting them down and going out the front hatchway, they're setting the stretchers down, and then they were setting down. So Ed counted what he thought was the appropriate number, and he goes and he had a remote, remote control device to, uh, to start the ramp going up, and he tells the pilot to take off, and he looks in there, and he's got a hole. The hole inside is full of people. And they, Gary got him up. He got him up off the ground, and he got him out of there, and then wow. the second aircraft came in to take the rest of the guys. Crew chief was a guy named Danny Hare, came from Alabama. Danny was there. And and they got and they said, so I had it pretty easy. All I had was all I had was a half dozen guys that were left, you know. Yeah. But here's the great thing, and, and so already I've got the story. Yeah. Now, Jeff tells me Jeff and I had a, had a connection a month earlier. Uh, there was a, a couple of incidents up in a little maybe 30 miles north of this, almost to the North Vietnamese border, where a tiger had attacked twice. And one time a Marine got mauled, another time a Marine right. got killed. So I was on the, the flight. We took a hunting team out that was going out to find this tiger. And it was the weirdest flight I was ever on because I'm not taking battle-dressed Marines. I'm taking guys that are going hunting. And I just, it was surreal. <laughs> well, two weeks later, they got the tiger. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Harnley was the gunner on, on the, the aircraft that went out and brought the team back in with a 300-pound Bengal tiger. And he's got a picture of it, which will go into this because it should. But Jeff tells me, he said, as they got up away from the river, he's out there and he's looking for muzzle flashes, anything, you know, to see, if, make sure to, you know, if he has to return fire or whatever. And he said, he couldn't believe it. He looks down here and there's this 400, he said, easily 400, 450 pound wild boar. And I said, what are you, 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 you creating a zoo? And he said, I don't know. One day it's a tiger, next day it's a wild boar. Now Danny Harris is sitting right there. He says, well, he said, yeah. And he said, not only that, he said, when we took off, he said, I'm looking down the same area, and I see a big old ape going through the trees. They had rock apes there. So, I mean, of all the things that are out there. You really the were in a jungle. I mean, yeah. And, and I'm saying, wow, I can't believe this. Now, I'm, I, so I got all this air stuff. I, I, I broke this down into three sections, the air, the infantry, and the artillery. The last, ever since our reunion, I've been looking and finding arti uh, air, or, uh, artillery and infantry guys. Now, down in Glastonbury, there's a place called Deer Crest Farm, in almost to Hebron. Yep, Glastonbury, Connecticut. And there's a gentleman there, there, there by the name of Bruce Jones, who was an officer in the artillery battalion, or artillery, excuse me, artillery regiment that was involved there. Now, Bruce wasn't in that specific battle he was in in others in the same area but i went and talked to him and bruce got me in touch with all these other guys so last week i end up getting getting in, in back and forth with emails and phone calls with one of the guys that was in the battle who was bringing the wounded and dead down the hill now he didn't have to medevac and he's saying ron i want to talk to your friends i want to thank them he said they got my buddies out of there mm -hmm. so all these things are starting to come together in such a beautiful way. And none of these guys have, have, have seen or heard of each other again in 40 years. And, and my guess is that nobody's asked them about this. I mean, wow, one of the things Wow, boy, did you hit on something, Zita. You, Go, you, I'm sorry. You, you said at the beginning that, that the, usually what is written is written from the, the eagle eye perspective from someone up here looking at the strategy of moving troops and moving machinery and, and the, the terrain and that sort of thing. But what you're talking about, you're, you're down in the, the, the micro, 
Um, you're, you're talking down to in the Ernie Pyle territory. You're in the Ernie Pyle territory, you exactly. Oh, so, yeah. so, is do you find that most of the people that you're interviewing are you getting their names and the contact information, kind of like one person knows somebody who knows somebody, or are you given a, a list of no. people you can contact? It's going away you first, and, and wow. I'll give you another example. Now, because Bruce sent my request out to all the people on his email list of his marine contacts. People started contacting me. One of the people who contacted me was a gentleman named Miles Davis. And I didn't click. The commanding general of that area of i -Corps who conceived of this operation was Major General Raymond Davis, who was three, a three-war veteran Medal of Honor recipient himself. Well, Davis is a pretty common name. Yeah, except that Miles was his son. Oh. Miles has offered me, and I interviewed Miles yesterday for about an hour, and there will probably be three more hours before we're done. One of the funniest things I've heard so far, and I, I was talking with you earlier about there's, there's Gallo's humor. He says, you know, he was, a, he was a second lieutenant, and he was in charge of one of the platoons. He said, everybody thinks that, you know, I'd really have it easy being the commanding general's son. He goes... I spent the whole time out in the jungle and I got wounded twice, <laughs> so he, he didn't have it easy. No special treatment, um, no. But what he does have is his dad has is, is long since passed, um, but he has, his dad was ordered to do his own chronology of that operation shortly after it ended, and his dad had a, a, um, a stenographer who took notes and all that, and what, what his son has is not okay. the original notes, but what what was written from those notes. Oh, nice. So he's going to show, share that with me. And, and he's got his own memoir, and he's got his own stories. And then he told me about another guy. One of the things about Operation Dewey Canyon, and it's, I, I, it, it clearly shows the, 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 the gulf, the ocean, between the political shenanigans that were going on in Washington, D.C., and what the guys on the ground were mm -hmm. actually doing. Now, at that time, if you read anything about the military and most of the popular media, they portrayed us as a bunch of walking, talking airheads, that yes. we didn't have a brain amongst us. Well, the commander of the 9th Marine Regiment, the guys that actually did the fighting, was uh, Colonel Robert Barrow. And Colonel Barrow, uh, were <laughs> I was told by another guy that I interviewed, Colonel Barrow used to walk around in the middle of this operation while all this was going on with a copy of Thucydides, the Peloponnesian Wars. The Greek and, Wars? Yes, he would read this as, as things were happening. Whenever he would get a moment, he would sit down and, and, he, and he would think these things through and how something that happened thousands of years oh. ago in military history would be applied to this and how he might be able to do something some way, somehow, some, some tactic, some strategy. Well, we had these ridiculous rules of engagement in Vietnam, the same as they do now in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the rules was we weren't allowed to go to Viet North Vietnam and we weren't allowed to go to Laos and we weren't allowed to go to Cambodia. Uh, meanwhile, the North Vietnamese were running right straight down through Laos and Cambodia because right. they couldn't come straight on without running into the, to the 3rd Marine Division. So they had all this sanctuary to, the, to, their, to themselves with an, an, an impunity to move through foreign countries, other countries, while we were supposedly held back there. Now this operation took place within a matter of quarter of a mile, half a mile of the Laotian border. But Colonel Barrow and General Davis read the rules of engagement, and they found a sentence that said, you can't go across the border to Laos unless you are being fired upon or in danger of being fired upon from across the border in Laos. So they mounted a raid, an ambush raid, that went across the border. Using and, 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 and within that context, the, the field commanders had discretion as to whether to do it or not, meaning it would be very nice for General Abrams and, 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 uh, and, and President Nixon to know about this, but uh, they didn't have to get permission first, so they didn't. And they mounted this tremendously successful ambush on the Ho Chi Minh Trail over in Laos, 
and, and really, really disrupted the daylights out of, out of what was going on because now the North Vietnamese had no idea, my God, these guys are not only here and beating the daylights out of yeah. us, but they're coming across the border. So it really threw a lot of things into disarray. Now, eventually, down, down the, the line, they gave approval for the raid yeah, that it actually it was in, worked so well. wasn't much they yeah. could do about it. You know, Ron, I, I have to tell you, um, we're already, well, we have 10 minutes left, okay. and I have a thousand questions to ask you. And let me just get a, a, couple, a sure. couple in here. Um, when you contact somebody and you tell them that you want to interview them for mm -hmm. the story, what is their typical response? And has anybody refused? No one has refused. Um, are they relieved? Are they excited? Uh, very excited. And, and also uh, a lot of, uh, see, there's, there's so many stories I've gotten that, that we really can't do it in this show. Yeah. And, and so you're going to have to read it when I'm done writing. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I have that on. You've got to agree to come back. Um, I keep hearing, and, and these are fantastic stories, fantastic, just to show the mindset of these guys on the ground, what, what great things they did. The, 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 the trials and tribulations of how they went through and all that, some wonderful things, tactics and strategy-wise, that they came up with to overcome all these weather issues and all that. And, and I keep hearing, no, nobody ever asked me about this before. No one has ever asked these people. The, what do you think then is, because um, we're talking about telling somebody's story. This was the, these are the, indivi the stories of the individuals, the, the, the Ernie Pyle viewpoint. Talk to me about the value of recording the personal experience of someone. It's not sanitized. It's their reflection. It's as real and as raw and as honest as it can be. Yeah. And if you want to know, if you want to learn from history, then you've got to know the real history. Yes, uh, and, 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 and there's things that people need to know. You have to have it from the bird's eye view so you can see how things right. unfolded and what things worked and what things didn't, but you also should know about the personal cost. And that's what I'm getting from these guys. And, and I think right now, most of it, in fact, what we're doing, uh, my unit's gonna have another reunion a year from now, 2015, down in Charleston, South Carolina, and we're inviting these guys to come down. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, because they're all saying, I, I wanna meet the guys that, that took all the wounded out from golf company. I said, well, I know who they are. I want to meet him and just say thank you. When this book comes out, and I don't know if you have a definitive date yet, but it's going to be sometime in early 2015? Yeah, I want, to, I, I, I want to really write full bore on this for about the next six weeks, and I think I'll be done because I'd like to have it ready for them so they can have it out by it, it, at least at the end of January, early February, to actually mark the anniversary of the, of the operation itself. This, we're almost at the end of September. You're going to have quite you a next couple of months. You know how fast I write. Oh yeah, my yeah, gosh, yeah. yeah. That's really something. <laughs> but you know, I, I have to tell you, because I, I was thinking about this, that the whole idea of telling stories. Now there was the movie, um, We Were Soldiers mm -hmm. Once, well the book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, the book by Joe Galloway. I didn't know until a few years ago when I was out in South Dakota for a, a good part of the year because my dad was dying. Yeah. I didn't know until that year that my cousin Matt Gunderson was in that operation, that he was part of that because he'd never talked about it. It, mm. it gets back into that whole thing of you can be so close to somebody. I mean, and his sister is, is he had, his sister and I are very close was never talked about. So what's the value then, number one, of having, you, you talked about having the unsanitized version of a story, but what about the value to the person who is telling the story, who, who gets to share it? Tremendous release, tremendous emotional mental, mental release, um, just to relive it. Uh, I think talking about it is, is paramount it should be and and we don't really have the time but i could tell you a couple stories about we some have people time for a couple mm -hmm. uh, simply i know a guy out in my town in hebron uh was point point uh squad on a on a patrol in the army um down in the central highlands of vietnam and they walked into a massive nva ambush and all but one or two of the guys in his squad himself and one other one or two other guys everybody else was killed and he carries this burden for years and years and years. And I finally uh, found out what unit he was in, and I went and looked it up. 
and come to find out, well, yeah, his his squad, they walked right. They were at point, and the, and the you know you know they were outnumbered monumentally. But his brigade behind him came forward, and and he had been pulled back. Uh, the lieutenant that was in his platoon received uh, the Medal of Honor posthumously because he went out and, and pulled some of the wounded back in, and it actually uh, established a little command zone, and they dropped a mortar right in the middle of it. Um, but at the end of the day, they overcame. They, 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 they counterattacked. They knew where the NVA were, and it was a massive victory. Well, all these years, this guy didn't know that because he was in oh. the first opening fire. And I went and looked at all, and I gave him a... Um, uh, I just printed out a thing, you know, I put it all together and, and, and the guys told me afterwards, they said, he hasn't spoken about Vietnam in 40 years. And he said, you give him that now he won't stop. <laughs> and good, I said, good. Good, good. You, <laughs> you got know? to talk about um, it. He needed to know that he didn't do anything wrong. That's, that's just, and that's where you need to see the ebb and flow of the battle. Right. You know, to him, that was the worst day of his life because 10, 11 of his friends got killed right there. Yeah. To the commander of that brigade, um, yes, and, and don't think for a minute that those guys don't feel it when they lose soldiers. Absolutely. But on, on his view of the battlefield, it was not the worst day of his life because, yes, they took losses, but they overcame their losses and then prevailed. And, and that's the thing people need to know about, and you only find that out when you talk to each when other. When you talk to them and, and each other. Yeah. When, you, when you have these conversations, do you see any part of, you know, the... Um, because you write fiction also, the classic hero's journey. Do, do, so, do you find that when you have these conversations, can the soldier then see himself or herself on that heroic journey? Not just, not that, like the, the young man you just mentioned, thinking, oh, I'm a failure because the, this, ex, this outcome wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But there is a heroic piece I'll, in I'll, there. I'll, I'll answer that by going back to what I was telling you about the raid across the border into okay. Laos. These guys were highly successful, they were smart, they were adaptable, they did it. 30 days later, the U.S. ambassador to Laos apologized to his counterpart in Laos for the intransigence of the 9th Marines having the audacity to go across the border. Oh. Uh, that shows you why there was such a gulf, such a separation. Um, guys couldn't trust the politicians. Oh, that's like you, oh, you know, that's not good. Um, and a lot of that came back down and people just didn't talk. We weren't, we weren't well received when we came home. Um, we were not encouraged to talk. Um, everything that was being said about us was being negative, so people didn't talk. You know, I need to interrupt you just yep. one second because we have very little time left, but I want to be sure the audience knows two things, three things. You can watch this show again on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com, Zeta TV Network, you'll be able to find this show. Other thing I want you to know is Ron is going to come back when the book on Operation Dewey County is published. And the other thing that I want you to know is he is going to be doing another interview with me on our sister show, Full Bloom, where we're going to talk about PTSD. And unfortunately, Ron, on that note, we are out of time. I'm going to thank you very much for coming back on the show. I also want to thank my crew, and I very much want to thank you and the viewing audience. I love to close this show with the words of the fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin. I think they apply very well to this show, too. She said, there have been no civilizations that did not use the wheel. Or there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel. But there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story. Find a way to tell it. And if you were involved in the Vietnam War Operation Dewey County, you want to talk to this man. Thank you very much. Join us next time. Food for the crew and guests is provided by Manchester Grill of Manchester, Connecticut and Angelo's Restaurant of Glastonbury, Connecticut. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email Zeta at ZetaTV.com or write to Zeta Christian, Page 1 TV, PO Box 1515, Manchester, Connecticut 06045 dash one five one five you can watch this and other episodes of page one on youtube.com slash zeta 3x3